Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about a recent TED Women's Conference in Palo Alto that was part of the TED movement. TED is spelled T-E-D, and it's a global virtual movement devoted to what it calls ideas worth spreading. It hosts an ongoing series of TED Talks, which can either be in person or online. There are many local chapters of TED called TEDx. For example, there's a TEDx Bay Area which organized the recent TED Women Conference. I have two guests who were involved in that conference. Francine Gordon is CEO of the F. Gordon Group, which works with global companies on issues such as innovation, leadership, and the advancement of women. She's a co-organizer of the TEDx Bay Area Women's Program, has a PhD from Yale, and was one of the first two women on the faculty of the Graduate Business School at Stanford University. She's held senior management roles at several high-tech firms and is currently writing a book on gender and innovation. Tatiana Canzavelli is the chief organizer of TEDx Bay Area, which hosted the recent TED Women Conference. She's held executive roles in a number of startups and large internationals. She was an early adopter of social media and social networking channels, using them to build successful online and face-to-face -face communities. She also runs a social customer relationship management consultancy, a Bay Area executives meetup group, global social CRM roundtables, and is a frequent speaker at conferences. We'll be getting to our guests in just a few minutes, but first we have a pre-taped interview with one of the speakers at the conference, California Secretary of State, Deborah Bowen. Let's go ahead and roll that tape. Deborah, what's on your agenda in your upcoming term as Secretary of State? Well, you know, I ran for the first time for two reasons, Florida and Ohio. There was such a controversy about whether our votes were being counted accurately and the integrity of our voting system that we had to put that in order. Uh, so we have done that in California. I'm pleased to reassure Californians that their votes will be counted exactly as they were cast. And now I will continue to work on getting every eligible Californian registered to vote uh, and then uh, getting everybody a convenient way to vote. My particular focus has been on young people and getting young people not just registered but engaged. The rate of voting is increasing m much more rapidly in the under 30 voters than in any other age group. So it's actually become cool to vote again. I know that you're also very concerned about uh, you know, women's issues and you're one of the relative handful of women who have been elected to statewide office in California. Do you have any special approach toward bringing women more into the political process as opposed to the population in general? Well, I, of course, I want to see every group um, registered, participating, um, and women historically have not run for and been elected to office in the same numbers. Uh, but there is some very interesting academic work. Uh, one of the things uh, ab about it is that women are much more self-critical than men. So they spend a lot of time thinking, well, am I qualified to run for this or that office? And by the time they decide, their male candidates have $500,000 in the bank. Now some people have said, in fact a lot of people have said, that money tends to skew democracy because it costs so much money to run that most people can't get over that hurdle. People who are otherwise qualified can make the race. No question that money plays a large role in politics and a larger role than I would like to see it play. But we do have a system of disclosure and reporting and my website which is sos.ca.gov provides information about where money is coming from for both candidates and for ballot initiatives and for ballot initiatives I have seen that be that information be one of the most significant factors in, that voters use in formulating an initial opinion who is funding this? If it's a, an issue um, that relates to pollution and they see that it's funded by oil companies, they're going to react differently than if they see that it's funded by environmental groups. You were involved in a group called TED Women, or at least you gave a talk there earlier today. What can you tell us about uh, that group? 
Well, it was, this is, the, I think, the first time that uh, TED has brought this kind of program to the Bay Area. And the idea is a, a series of relatively short talks that are intended to spark the imagination and that span the subject matter. Uh, it's not all politics. It, it included, um, oh, just a huge variety of issues. And um, we had some arts included as well. It really is intended to be not kind of just a gripe session about, oh, there aren't enough women and it would be better if there were more, but um, uh, inspiration and a look at things that are going well, changes that are happening. Uh, and I was really inspired. I spent the whole day listening to other people's talks. That was California Secretary of State Deborah Bowen. Francine, it must have been a pretty good women's conference if the highest ranking female state official in California spent the entire day there. What do you feel really came out of the conference? It was thrilled that she spent the whole day. We thought she would speak and leave. And in her talk that you just heard, Deborah mentioned the fact that she found it inspirational. And a big part of what came out of it was people feeling nourished in terms of knowing that there's a future for what can be done feeling excited about the possibilities and starting a lot of dialogue among the people who were there. I think we have a graphic that shows the title page of the program. Maybe we could see that graphic. I think we have it. Yeah, yeah and I have a brochure with me, so I can yeah. show you. So that. anyway, you know, TED is all about ideas. So what were some of the ideas that came out of the conference? A lot of the speakers talked about their own stories and how they had, in some cases, overcome very difficult circumstances, and in other situations, talking about what inspired them to do what they've done, to give examples of how you can follow your passion and make a difference in the world. We had um, a couple of people who talked about things that they're doing in third world countries, in one case to end uh, poverty by building devices to help people in Africa and other third world areas, for example, to help the women carry, carry water or be able to have enough wood to get through the night in terms of the Darfur. And the woman who talked about that talked about how she had been um, encouraged to do that. She came to that conclusion because she had grown up on an Indian reservation and how she had been inspired by the engineers, which... Now, is this largely about building community, networking, creating ties between women to help each other advance? It was about creating, uh, in encouraging women to speak up and to follow what they want to do, to understand that sometimes our biggest barriers are ourselves, and to say, go do it. Um, that because if you have something you believe in, you have something that you feel passionate about, don't be held back by the, I shouldn't, I couldn't, I can't. And time and again, they were hearing examples of women in science, education, even in the food industry, overcoming the odds and, and going forward. So, so a little consciousness raising and confidence building? Yes, and, like that. and the community. We allowed plenty of time for people to talk, make connections, and explore you know, what the various speakers meant to them. Now, what role do men play in this? I know there were some male speakers at the event with their male attendees as well. What, what did the men contribute? There are, um, actually, we had hoped to have more male attendees. We had some, not as many as we would have liked. How many people attended the entire event? Actually, we had over 400 people who wanted to attend. Yes. We um, actually had space for 170, and uh, most of those people showed up. So it was a pretty mixed group. Did you have a virtual presence? Could people follow it on the internet? We did. We had the live audience, and then it was live streamed, so people were able to both watch it real time on their computers if they chose to, as well as uh, there was a lot of tweeting going on throughout. And we had a very active group of people in the background who were tweeting the messages of what had been conveyed during the conference. Now, is this about addressing a problem like there's something wrong with women's place in society now and we have to change it somehow? It's less about that. I mean, this was not a conference about what's wrong and let's all complain and say things are terrible. It was really about what can be done when you set your mind to it and understanding that, and many of the women talked who were in the conference, how they were scared of things or felt barriers or felt that they had to overcome odds, but they did it. And when they put their minds to it, when they put their passion to it and their energy, they made it happen. Do you think that in order to accommodate women in the marketplace more, men have to change the way they behave? 
I don't know if it's a question of how men behave. It's more a question of understanding that there are language differences. One of the speakers, Myra Strober, talked about uh, habit of mind and in interdisciplinary conversations. And she pointed out that when you talk about bringing women into the management environment, to a business environment, women sometimes communicate differently, not better, not worse. And so it helps to, just like you go to another country and you learn a little bit about the culture there, to learn a little bit about the differences in how men and women communicate. So really it's more about that and not about changing behavior. So you mean men and women speak different languages and they have to have a unified language that they can both understand? They just have to understand that they have different languages and appreciate that in each other. Okay. Well, we're going to have to move on to the next segment of the program right now. And we have another pre-taped interview with one of the conference speakers, John Hagel. And John Hagel works at the big management consulting firm of Deloitte, where he's director of the Center for the Edge, which researches emerging business opportunities. So let's go ahead and roll that tape. 